You are listening to Baking Boss Kitchen Secrets with Naomi Rose, the food business talk show that shares with you the reality of what's happening in the food and hospitality industry. I am on a mission to help as many people as possible grow and build successful food businesses. Each week on this podcast, you'll get useful information, top tips, as well as what's really happening in the kitchen behind the scenes. Let's get on to today's show. Well, hello, lovely listeners, and welcome to another episode of Baking Boss Kitchen Secrets. I have got a really great episode in store for you today because I've got a very special guest. I've got Aidan from Lovingly Artisan, an amazing bakery based in Cumbria, in Kendal, if you haven't heard of it, because I know some of you are international, so this is in the north of England. And they are a small creative sourdough bakery that have just news news off the charts won britain's best bakery for the second year running what an amazing achievement and welcome aiden hello lovely to be here oh i'm I'm so excited i've been looking forward to talking to you guys for ages actually i've i've I follow you on social media and your social media is brilliant and i love your love your journey love your story and love your approach to baking so because my listeners are a mixture of people that are just getting into starting or they've got a baking business. Where did it all begin for you? Well, what, how did you, how did it all come about? For myself, it actually be a long, long time ago. Uh, so, so nearly 35 years ago now. And um, it was just uh, a sort of an inspirational trip to Paris uh, after a, a term of college at Boston College of Culinary Arts and, and sort of looking to set up a business. And I came back from there and it was just a weekend in Paris, a sunny weekend in Paris, and I was sort of thought, I really could set up a lovely little patisserie at home, and and that's how it sort of started from there. And and I opened my first bakery when I was twenty four, um, a sort of little artisan bakery, but that was very different, very different to the bakery that we have now, uh, which is a different, a different bakery. Lovingly artisan, we started about fifteen years ago, and that that. Uh, that sort of period of, of baking, you know, a career baking, running a small business, it, that bakery evolving. It was mostly French inspired and yeast yeast driven. And we actually did make sourdough right way, way, way back, you know, 30 years ago, we, we uh, had been asked to make sourdough and it was something we had to, um, uh, we didn't know what what's this sourdough this this chef is asking us to make, but we went away and we learned learned how to do it, and we just made it for this one little restaurant, and um and we made this bread for this one little restaurant, and we then ate the bread ourselves, but never ever thought of selling it to a soul because nobody ever asked for it. But then that knowledge just just over the years we just kept that knowledge, and it was always bubbling away in the background. And 15 years ago, we started uh, Lovingly Artisan, and we 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 very much thought, well, there's an opportunity now to start a totally sourdough-driven bakery because see the way the market was already well established um, in London, and and you could see the growth of health awareness, and and we knew it was the way to go, and we very much set up Lovingly Artisan as a very organic. You know, from a tiny little start, we decided not to borrow any money. We said, let's do this with no money at all and see how we get on. Then we're not having to beholden to any bank manager or anything. We're just, we're our own boss and we can go where it goes. And some friends actually lent me equipment. Somebody lent me an oven. Somebody lent me a mixer and said, don't worry about buying it, Aiden. Just, you know, when, you, when, when you've got chance, when you've made some money, just give us, you know, give us a few quid and it'll be fine. Um, and it started like that in a really small way. And we started on a train station. Uh, the main line, uh, Glasgow to London Euston line runs through Kendall. And we started in a little lockup shed the size of a garage there. And we were just producing for wholesale. And what happened was customers, people on the platform smelt the bread and started wandering around looking for this smell. And then they started buying and and then we put a coffee machine in and it grew from there. Um, sort of, again, as I say, in a lovely organic way, I think it's very difficult to stop uh, 
an artisan bakery from growing because people want to love you <laughs> and, <laughs> and because you, you're making gorgeous bread you're doing something gorgeous and and you're sort of passionate about it and people buy into it and and it's that they buy into your journey they want to support you there's something there's something unique about a bakery within a community what it brings to that community and what it brings to those individuals who come and buy the bread off you it brings far more than just a loaf of bread with an artisan bakery and um, that 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 support that they give you that sort of lifestyle choice that they give themselves that they're buying this loaf that's good for them and and about the heritage and everything about it is a key and then you find that that attracts other food businesses become attracted to you so so that was that was the start of our journey and all the bumps and bumps and everything in between oh i mean that's just incredible and i think it goes to show that if you've got a passion and you've got a great idea and that approach to being solutions rather than solution focused rather than thinking about the problems, you can make it happen. I think that's and that's something that a lot of people think that they need lots of money and they need to go into doing something. Actually, you don't have to. You can start from very little and really grow from there, can't you? You you really can you do you because because you don't have to make all the products. I, I think unfortunately I think Instagram is a bit uh, is is difficult sometimes because uh, people can look and see all these bakeries and see all the equipment and see all the products and think oh I have to do that and if I'm not doing that I'm not actually adequate. But it's so not true that actually a simple well made loaf with a story sold to a sold to a customer and they will definitely be back the following week they don't need all the other things they will come just for one loaf and um, and you can start with with such a tiny tiny range i remember when i started we literally had two old domestic ovens that we used i had to get up at midnight to produce any type of volume because it could only bake sort of i think the most i could bake 10 loaves at a time and that was it you know <laughs> so so it took forever forever just to make just enough to sell to to you know to make any money for the day and but then obviously as you grow you sort of get another piece of equipment and and it is that organic growth it gives you time to learn about your business and i think sometimes if you have too much money or capital willingness to invest capital at the start and you bring in too much kit and bring in too much capacity the business can run away very quickly because as i said people people want to to adopt you you know they come they will be banging on your door it's very difficult it's very very difficult i think to to hold a bakery back absolutely and i think it's so true when you say that people want to support local i mean this is a real big trend that we're particularly seeing at the moment yeah and sorry my camera's just decided to launch itself but i think people like to buy from people that they like and they want to see people do well and there's something very as a consumer there's something very satisfying about spending money where you can see it's going to something that will help the community and be better and i think that's really important I think um, one of the most important things that we've we found and, and one of the most important parts of our growth is from the very beginning, we were enormously lucky um, that we formed a relationship with Andrew and Billy at Gilchester Organics up in Northumbria. And they were in the early stages of their business as well. And to be involved with a farmer in that way at that time was, again, something that wasn't usual. And when we got to know Andrew and Billy uh, more and what they did and were left dumbstruck at at how how much effort he put into producing this grain in an organic way um, and how beautiful it was when you visited the farm every time we visited the farm each year and you would you had this almost spiritual um experience as you went down to the fields and you realized how alive the fields were with insects and wildlife and and what what a beautifully natural system ecosystem it was and um, and that 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 relationship with the farmer with andrew and that somebody telling us that that absolute detail about about the grain about what that grain brought to us about why this particular how be it rye which rye or spelt or einkorn or emma or, or or the wheat or whatever it was this 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 understanding of that grain and then thinking as a humble baker thinking oh my god you know that 
that transformed our understanding of what previously had been you bought a bag of flour and you made bread. Well, suddenly you weren't buying a bag of flour anymore. You were buying this farmer's experience, his his toil at, at creating and growing this beautiful grain and how how you know how the seasons and the weather and everything each year being aware of the weather and how andrew might be struggling with the harvest or things weren't so good and how that affected the grain that we got that i'd never had that relationship before but that that gave us something special it gave us something that we held on to as our core and decided this is this is the foundation this is where we need to start and then we need to honor what he's done in the way that we make the bread and then and then with each of the grains we became a bread led bread focused business because of that uh, because we thought there is enough in every one of these grains and then created breads that honored the different grains and and had a story about them a lot about the nutrients that we would bring because a lot of that information was totally new to us we weren't aware of of the amazing health properties of rye and then the amazing properties of rye as a plant you know that it grows and i know it's become very sort of it has become very in now to talk about regenerative farming and, and, and those things. But, uh, but I think that the focus for us as bakers should be on the grain. It is that it is, it is the actual grain itself. Uh, um, and definitely from an organic system. And um, that's important for what we do. And, and that you'd be amazed how many people we have uh, in Altrincham, where our bakery is in, in what our little bakery in Altrincham, um, what we call our urban bakery <laughs> uh, <laughs> in Altrincham. Um, the, there's a hospital nearby, and consultants actually send patients to the bakery when they're having digestive issues and they send them and say, go and ask for Catherine and Catherine will tell you what bread is best for you. You know, <laughs> and, and people love it and people come and then they become absolutely loyal customers. And they tell us, tell us about their journeys. We had one woman uh, last week who came to see us and tell us that she had been recommended to us uh, for our sourdough and she had reversed her type two di- diabetes on a diet with with our bread and with obviously with veg and other things but it, she said it was a cornerstone of her turning around uh from, from that disease and it is that powerful and i think that message that message there's something about that message about the power of bread as as an unbelievably amazing and healthy food we believe that's the thing that's got sustainability that that people sugary things and sweet things that the, there is a sort of a you know it can be like donuts go through these cycles have been really in vogue everybody's eating donuts now and everybody's on on cruffins and it, it, you just you can go through all the different things but if you have a hard core that we are about bread we're about feeding the community in a healthy way that has real sustainability as regards the sales that we get in the the customers that we keep the the loyalty that we that we build that we're providing something that is essential to their daily to their daily way of life that's what that's what we knew we had to create something like that that's why we're so bread focused oh I, that's that's such a great story and uh, it's incredible that bread has been given this kind of bad rep of being bad for you but it it really isn't if it's done in the right way of course and absolutely sourdough is so has so many health benefits that people don't really realize i want to talk a little bit about what have been some of your key successful moments over the years that you've seen that have been real standout highlights for you um oh that's that's actually quite hard (laughs) it's quite hard i'm going to say so 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 successful highlight highlights let's let let's 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 say highlights business is a roller coaster and and obviously you're talking to bakers in business and and you go through this cycle of things where things feel absolutely terrible and then you'll get a grip of that situation and things build up and it becomes better and 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 also that the scary moments when you're just starting off and you don't know is this going to work so one of the scary moments for us was we moved from we moved from home so we was so we had a little lean to greenhouse at home that we turned into our bakery at the very very start and we made a jump from from home to to the train station at Oxenholm on the main line and when we made that jump so all of a sudden we were paying rent we had you know electric bill to pay we had this big oven and equipment that we borrowed but all of a sudden we had responsibility that we had rent to pay every week so we had to make money um and it was just on my own and it, 
and we'd got this this tiny it was li- it was literally the size of a, a, a garage we would managed to squeeze a 15 tray deck oven in the back of it one mixer one table and one rack and that was it um and we started and i got a little counter uh counter out of the front made out of railway sleepers actually it was really cool uh, a friend made it for me and and that was it and we just had a, a small amount of bread on there and it was beautiful simplicity anyway so we hadn't really advertised we hadn't really put any signs out and people were bimbling off the train station and finding us and it was lovely and on the second day i'm there on my own and it was about 10 o'clock in the morning and um this very smart car parked outside the front of the bakery with this chap stood by it looking all very smart not speaking very much and uh, so that I, I didn't think much about it and then and, and then five minutes later prince charles walks across the car park <gasps> No way. The guy in the smart <laughs> car was Prince Charles's equerry, just waiting to pick him off, off off the train and take him up to an appointment up in up in Cumbria. And um, so he handed his bag to his equerry and walked over. And he stood. We had a fifteen minute chat about bread and about food. No other customers came. Nobody there. It was the loveliest, loveliest. And that that was definitely a startup highlight. I was there in this terrified phase, you know. <laughs> And, and I had this ever, ever so lovely experience of somebody who was so passionate about food and so knowledgeable about food. And they have such, they are so, so good at talking and making you, you know, feel that they're showing real interest in what you're talking about. So that was certainly, that was certainly a, a highlight in the early days, a private little moment that I, I was able to have. And that was great. And um, what went on then was we we sort of went on a journey as the business grew. I say what is always a highlight is is as the business grows. And I think the first competition we entered into was the World Bread Awards in 2014. Um, it's the first time we entered anything. And uh, we didn't really expect to come away with anything from that. And we won. Uh, we won People's Choice. I won the Real Bread campaign uh, sponsored um uh, speciality loaf and we won something else so we came away with three category wins uh from the real bread awards and that was a thing that sort of gave us a hunger we were really really chuffed because uh it was the first time we'd entered anything and we were going all the way down on the train to london to deliver the bread um and to bring that back and then be pr- so proud of that it sort of felt well actually we do know what we're doing and maybe we can do this quite well and then being able to tell that story to the customers and how much they appreciated it and i think that started us on a journey with doing competitions and we we we've had a lot of very very special moments with competitions and we've been very very lucky uh to win national bakery of the year best baker best artisan baker twice now and and lots and lots of 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 individual awards for breads and things on the way but we use it to to measure ourselves to measure ourselves against are we actually are we actually cutting the mustard are we are we actually you know good enough because as a community although it, the, our community is relatively small as artisan bakers and we're pretty well spread out all over the place Yeah, because we're all working so hard. <laughs> we don't get out much. It's not like you can <laughs> down and see, see your mate from, from, from his artisan bakery down the road. No, because he's got his head down and he's in bed and, you know, <laughs> and it, it's, it's difficult. So, so that was the other thing about, uh, about being involved in awards that they become uh, almost a social a social event where you get to see the people that you know and the friends the friends that you have within the industry so those 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 are special and then i think when we moved from the train station so we were at the train station and the business got to a size where we moved into again stepped up into bigger premises and we found a really good location uh, and some premises that had been used already you know actually for making sausages but it was we walked into this building that was basically ready prepared so it was beautiful so we didn't have to worry about floors and drains and fridges and and all of those things because it was all in and then as that a highlight is always when you see the customers find your new location and the 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 each week that the queues start to grow and they start to get bigger and you have lovely things i suppose one of the things recently a highlight recently is 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 hearing a customer say i do my shopping every week but i save this to last because this is my favorite place to come and where people hold the bakery in such esteem that it becomes a favorite place I think it's something that we we should all aim for, but it's such a difficult, difficult thing to achieve. I have to say that Catherine um, is is that that side of the business. She is very special. I think 
bakers as bakers, we have an enormous, enormous amount to do. Just running a bakery and actually producing that bread day in, day out, consistently and beautifully is very, very hard. To then have on top of that the pressures of social media, styling, photography, and all of those things for one person is is a stretch, a real stretch. So we work really well as a team because Catherine brings has those skills that in in a way that I don't have, and that ability to communicate really you know brings messages like that. People saying this is my favorite place, but it is their favorite place because Catherine manages to 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 deliver online what we are and and uh, somebody stopped her the other day we were well we were in Birmingham and somebody said to her you're the bread lady you're just like the lady on Instagram (laughs) (laughs) well I am the lady on Instagram (laughs) and it, it is that it is that making it real so we try very hard that what people see is exactly what we are we're not it's not a false thing we don't we don't farm our social media out to out to a third party because because to then maintain that link of of this is who we are and because ultimately as artisans it should be we should be the people front and center we shouldn't be sat in an office we actually should be in there with our hands in the dough in the shop all the time and yes businesses grow but i still believe that to be a true artisan you have to be there you have to be the face of the business and that that's what like we said at the start it's about that it's about that friendship thing people buy into you you know people want to see Mm. you that's what they want um in a lovely way i think it's one of the most again one of the highlights is that is one of the most rewarding things about having a successful bakery is the relationships that you build with people and then we have all sorts of celebrities who 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 come but um uh, i'd say one of my other highlights is uh, jonathan warburton bought his christmas bread from us <laughs> on, that's on amazing christmas. so yeah so <laughs> he's ever such a lovely guy yes you know uh, and, and we went uh, he he showed us around his bakery you know after christmas but but that 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 type of thing tickles you you know little little ironies like that you think oh you know but but at heart he's just a baker like the rest of us and he loves his business just like the rest of us um controversial though that might be for me to say <laughs> <laughs> oh no it's incredible and i think it's so true that you can have a great bakery but the storytelling the visibility behind it is equally as important to get yourself out there and get your story told which i think so many people there's so many people that have great products but they just miss the bit of actually really telling that story and bringing people into their own world of baking and i think that is really really important it's it's so important nowadays because we've lost that within retailing that actually it's so much about packaging what's on the shelf uh, mm-hmm. and 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 the 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 staff within supermarkets and retail they don't speak to you so actually the beauty of an artisan bakery is that actually people people want to speak to you we stand the markets we love trading on the markets and and you were going to ask me about the bread truck in a bit i but am trade, trading on the markets is special to us and what's special is about talking to people and that communication Absolutely. So that probably segues us nicely onto the bread truck then, because this is a this is a bit of a new venture for you, isn't it? Uh, we got the bread truck. Well, when COVID hit, we were we were a seventy five percent wholesale, twenty five percent retail business. Pretty standard. We'd grown standard as a bakery, and 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 that's where we were. And COVID came along, and then obviously no wholesale at all, overnight all gone. And it was like, Ooh, right. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we were front and center retail. That was all we had left. Um, the the lovely market that we're on in Altrincham, um, mm. got their act together really quickly, and they organised uh, organised so that the food traders could all trade, and we didn't miss a day, and we were able to trade, and they created a really nice, welcoming environment for people, where they were having unpleasant experiences in the supermarket. Suddenly, they were in they were in this area on the market the music was playing the birds were tweeting obviously the sun was shining because it was glorious oh it's beautiful and they started <laughs> very quickly realized hey if i phone my friend i can meet them in the bread queue and we can have a we can have a chat together quite legally you know <laughs> and and it was it, it that that trading element it we took that that 
pandemic was a big learn for us that how you realized how important that interaction was for people. And we thought this is what's missing from modern retail. It's actually this simple fact that we need to to be friends with our customers. We need to make the experience. And and all all levels of people were there. And and you know, we have a great mix of people, both north and south, you know, up here in Cumbria. But that that was lovely. So the bread truck came about because so so we were concerned. We didn't know at the start of COVID what's going to happen. You know, is this going to be all right? Are, are we going to be able to still trade in Manchester? Will we be able to you you had no idea what was going to happen. So we said, let's order a a, a a truck, a takeaway food truck. Um, we decided to 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 get a new one. That's what we thought we'd spend our, our COVID loan on. Um, and we ordered it, and obviously it didn't come because there were no vans. You couldn't get it. <laughs> so we ordered this thing, and it never came during COVID. So we did COVID, and and it was great. And we, and we, we managed fine. We, we built amazing retail relationships, and it changed our balance. And that now we're about 55% retail and just 45% wholesale. And it's a beautiful wow. balance, much more comfortable balance. Then at the end of COVID, the bread truck arrived. <laughs> we thought, oh, right. But we realized that. So we sat on it for a little bit. But then we thought, right, well, we do the farmer's market down in Kendall and we finished it off and we did it very much. We were sort of inspired by the French markets where they clearly all, a lot of the market traders on the French markets roll up in their in their vans and they open up the sides and and they look like they properly look like mobile shops and so we made sure that the design of it was so that the the side was long and it literally looked like our our shop up here we have lots of um ironwork i have a friend who's a blacksmith and he sort of created beautiful uh, iron uh shelving um and it's just quite it's very stylish it looks nothing like a burger van um, it has its own unique style. And we, first of all, rolled out the bread truck. And Catherine is chairman of our local farmer's market in Kendall. And as soon as we rolled it out, it was, it was this is what we should be doing. And it, it is such a good thing to do. People absolutely love it. And now we do another local market on a Thursday. And we've just been standing at Kirby Lonsdale Market to get today. And it's that thing that we can keep all of the product nice and dry rather than standing under a pop up and getting wet and trying to keep it and trying to keep warm. We yeah. have this lovely truck. We can get loads of bread on it. We've got a great coffee machine and we can make it look amazing. That's one of the problems when you're on a, when you're just on a regular three meter pop up. It's a real struggle to set up and make it look beautiful. Absolutely. Well, because of the way this this truck is, we can make it look gorgeous, and it does, and and it and it looks nice, and it it gives us that versatility that we can sort of that flexibility as a business. Because one of the other lessons from COVID was to learn that we need flexibility. We don't know what's coming down the tracks, and we need that that ability to be able just to be a bit agile. Um, you know mm -hmm. that that if. If we're not able to trade in Manchester for some reason, what are we going to do? Well, we've got this truck now, so we can actually trade somewhere else. So we can, or you know, we can we can do something just down the road. It it I think agility is a key now that you can't put all your eggs in one basket and say this is what we do and this is how we're doing it. Those days are gone. <laughs> we, have to, we have to think. We have to we have to think agile, and we also have to think forward. So we have to sort of think ahead and think right. What if? What if? But what if? You know, further down the line. So that that was how, and and we dearly we dearly love the bread truck. We've currently got a naming. Catherine did a thing on Insta where she's got people to name the bread truck because it didn't have a name. Which clearly, I'm thinking, what do you want to do that for? It's just a bread <laughs> truck. But then it went and generated a load of interest. Um, and we had, I, I was stood with Catherine on one of the market and a local special needs school brought all their children from this class and they're all stood in front of the bread shop and they were all little, writing what they thought it should be called and putting all their names in a hat. <laughs> <laughs> My God, the pressure is intense. Um, so we've not actually we've not actually decided on the name yet. But I know Catherine. Again, you see, Catherine will make the best of that. In that, that she will treat that that effort that those people have put in to getting involved. She will treat that with the utmost respect to make sure that we we involve them in the decision and that it's not a this is the name. Thanks very much. She will really. She she will. She will talk to those people in a lovely way so that so that we get the best out of it and it leaves everybody with a lovely warm feeling, hopefully. 
Oh, fantastic. I hope I like the name. <laughs> well, yeah, well, absolutely. Well, if my listeners want to get involved, I go, go on go on to social media and go and give them a follow and find out how yeah, you can please. be involved in the naming <laughs> ceremony. So obviously this podcast is talking about some of the realities of what it's like to run your own baking business. So what have been some of your challenges over the years? Um. Well, I think uh, challenges is obviously growth and finance, but we decided to 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 handle that by by just being very careful and growing organically. And that's certainly, uh, I think that one the, that is a challenge when you decide to do that. Say, right, we're not going to borrow any money; we're going to do this organically, mm-hmm. because at, at the start it's very difficult. You say you can cost it out and you can make a profit, but obviously you're not turning over a vast amount of money, so you're not actually generating a lot of profit. So at the at the start it feels very very slow and it feels very very hard so it's a challenge to sort of stick to that or not to go crazy because i think too much too much cash too much borrowing make does make you a bit complacent about your decisions but if you're limited on money that discipline that challenge at the start actually makes you make better decisions about what you spend your money on um and then and then growth is always a challenge because growth means you as soon as you mean growth you mean recruitment and that's that is always the biggest challenge for all of us without a shadow of a doubt we were at a seminar yesterday with a a group of other business owners but not within our field totally different totally different sectors from everything from from solicitors to to recruitment agents and everything but staffing was the common the common conversation. And people think, oh, it's only me and I can't keep any staff and why do I have all these problems? But it's always the same. So that is that is always a constant challenge. But I think that I'm old enough now to know that actually that's just a fact of life. And you have to do your best to 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 treat your staff with respect. And you just have to roll with the punches when you get let down and you know just just do your best to look after them and hopefully then they will deliver their best to you but that is always a constant challenge and um, the energy crisis was was a challenge but we one of the things we had done was we had unbeknown just before the energy crisis we had purchased a really big uh pellet wood-fired oven so we got to a point where we are deck oven our 15 tray deck oven wasn't big enough and we needed a bigger oven but there wasn't enough electric on our site to do that and so we bought a big steam tube oven and we had choices of oil gas or wood pellet um and i had in the in the past had a wood pellet oven before and i thought no i think we'd like to try that and i understood from the technology that you you are a bit more involved that it's not just it's not just roll it through the door, press a button, and that's it. You have to be involved in it. You have to understand how the burner works. You have to be prepared to get stuck in and fix it when it breaks down. And and you do have to be prepared. But the technology is not very difficult. And and actually having that involvement in the maintenance of the oven has changed the way that the boys in the bakery think about the oven. You know, it's more of a part. It's more like it's more like having an arga in the corner of the bakery rather than having you know a piece of of electrical kit that they couldn't throw away and get a new one tomorrow it's not thought of like that so power power was definitely a challenge we also have a challenge with power as well because here um we are in a rural location so all of our power comes over land and we were very we are very prone to power cuts um so one of the things we saved up for was a generator um and we've got that now and that's wired in and that saved our saved our bacon twice in the last three months like seriously when we'd had no power and if we'd lost power it's about when you've prepared all those sours and they're all sat in the fridge and 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 all the croissant that you've made and they're all sat frozen in the freezer you you know the thought of losing your day's production but all of that stock that you potentially lose as well with power cuts and i think power is a power is an issue for all of us for the future that we need to it's one of those things that we sort of need to think about and certainly we're just uh working on a new building now and the challenge there is to think about solar and to think about how much can we power can we bring into the business to give us power security because i i do think that as a challenge one of our challenges is about being being not off grid but being independent enough that you are not the whole thing doesn't fall apart when you're you know the services that you expect to receive are not available um so that's that's a big challenge and then the other challenge the last challenge that's been most challenging most recently is with the war in ukraine suddenly the organic grain consistency going all over the place Mm -hmm. um 
Now, we were used to working with different quality grains because Gilchester, in that natural, the natural way it is, it changes. But we had uh, become, we'd relied on white, you know, organic flour as our as our main flour. That that was consistent. But as soon as the war started in Ukraine and the grain supply was not necessarily coming from Ukraine and the organic grain was coming from other countries, the consistency became very sort of sketchy. And when you supply in wholesale, they want the same every day. You can sort of squeak through it with retail customers and you can talk to them about it. But for the wholesale market, it is challenging. But we've managed not to resort to, we've, we've not resorted to using improvers or anything. We've managed to to work through it. And it's actually approved our baking skills as well because we, we we see it as a challenge. And it's about changing our techniques so that we can cope with those really low protein flours um, and proteins that are not sort of strong enough. Sorry to talk a bit nerdy bakery, but no, you know. No, it's it, fascinating. Right? They, but... are, they are a challenge. So those those problems with, with, with supply of quality ingredients are a challenge. And especially when... When you've said we're going to be organic and we're going to do this when when the flour is not protecting you from the variability because if you're buying sort of milled mass milled flour they they obviously mill it to a standard so they'll have a recipe and you will get that flour and it will be the same all all the time but as soon as, as soon as you start talking organic or or or, or grown in different ways then all of that sort of becomes you know more variable it makes the job more interesting <laughs> uh, absolutely yes I, I remember when the uh, war the war in ukraine we we've been getting our flour from a supplier and they literally went the delivery lead time just went through the roof and suddenly we found we're out without flour <laughs> it, was a, it was such a nightmare to try and na- navigate through not just for us but for them as well because they were desperately trying to solve the problem of yeah none of their customers could get flowers so it's a really interesting challenge this has been a really interesting conversation so thank you ever so much for coming on my podcast i'm going to ask you one final question and that is what is your absolute favorite bread to make Oh, right. Oh, so I'm going to say my absolute favourite bread to make at the moment um, is uh, is our Northumbrian rye. I love rye bread. The technique is so far from what we normally do. Um, but the Northumbrian rye is because we get that. I spoke to you right at the start about the rye grain. So we get this long straw heritage rye. It is the most beautiful grain in the field. It, but when I started to to learn about it and about the plant itself is amazing because it's like its own weed killer. No weeds grow anywhere near it at all. So they don't need to do anything with it. Don't need to spray it because it's so tall and it never gets mildewed near the grain. But when you make the bread and, and this totally different technique, we had this lovely German baker who was on, on holiday in the Lake District and he parked in our car park in his camper van. And he said to me, oh, I'm a German baker. And we started talking and everything. And uh, he looked at our rye bread. He said, do you want me to show you how to make real rye bread? And I said, of course I do. <laughs> so he showed us how to make this 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 pure rye bread um, just with rye flour. And we have these three different ferments that we create. And the result is so unbelievably full of flavor. It's obviously quite dense, but not dense. It's actually it's actually quite light. Um, I love the way that it keeps for a week or more. The 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 level of antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, and everything. It, it's that thing about it's that thing about Catherine and I have this mantra that we believe the world will be right if we can put bread back at the center of the table. But to put bread back at the center of the table, we need to create bread like this rye that is so packed with nutrients that it becomes a cornerstone of people's diets. It's like not something they could do without. And that's what we've moved away from because ultimately that pe- that loaf, as, as it is and as it's made, is how it was done for thousands of years. And, and you, when you eat that and think, oh, my God, no wonder they lived off bread. And and then you really see this whole picture of where where the bread industry has taken us to, and see how million miles away from where it was. And even though the sourdough revolution is 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 amazing, I still would like to see us move back to these these 
densely nutritious breads and and unbelievable flavors um yeah that so so that's my favorite bread to make at the moment absolutely favorite and i love the way it looks and everything that that incredible rustic look you know that when you when you put it in the basket and it's sort of slightly upside down and all sort of messy and and you turn it out and the way that it naturally splits so you don't cut it and you get that gorgeous gorgeous crackle on the top and it and it has flavors caramelly flavors and everything you think how does the grain do that how how do you get from that to that so yeah you can tell it's my favorite bread <laughs> oh you know I, I can't wait to come to kendall and come and actually try it because i'm actually not too far from you now so i'm very much looking forward to trying that and absolutely i think this has been so interesting so thank you very much for your time and i think let's put bread back in the middle of the table is a great way to end on <laughs> absolutely that's gotta that's gotta be the artisan's mission bread back at the center of the table Right, you heard it here first, folks. Go and get bread back in the middle of the table. Aidan, it's been a true pleasure. Where can people go and find you and follow you? So uh, you can follow us on lovingtheartisan.com. Uh, you know, our Instagram, our Instagram is great. You have to go and look at it. Catherine takes great, great pictures. Um, and then our shops, we are here at just outside Kendall. We're on the main road. So if you're coming into the Lake District, the South Lake District, we're on the main road into Lake District. And we're, we're, we're just outside Kendall, a, a little area called Plumgas. There's a sort of uh, farm shop. There's loads of food businesses, really interesting, dead good. And then our urban, so that's our country bakery, but that's our HQ. And then our urban bakery is in South Manchester in Altrincham. Um, uh, Alti Market is a famous market, one of the best markets in the country. Really eclectic, fantastic mix of people, gorgeous atmosphere, loads of restaurants. Uh, you know, that's our other place. And then the other place is we deliver nationwide. So that's UK nationwide, uh, brilliant online service. All the ba- bread is packed into wax bags, beautiful boxes. Um, so we do a great deal service there. You just need to go online and see our website and that's how you order. Um, and that's us. You can definitely have to try us. Oh, definitely. Go on. Go online and order now before you miss out. So thank you ever so much. And here's to the next episode. As ever, folks, happy baking. Thank you for listening to Baking Boss Kitchen Secrets with Naomi Rose. If you're enjoying this podcast, then please do give it a review. And don't forget to subscribe and follow. If you want to get some useful resources, then do visit my website, bakingboss.net. And give me a follow on social media at Naomi Rose Baking Boss and I am Baking Boss. We'll see you on the next episode.